Welcome to another video edition of Think with Google. I'm Mark Howe, Managing Director, Industry Relations, Google EMEA, and I'm joined today by Dr. Grace Kite, founder and economist of Magic Numbers, and Tom Roach, VP Brand Strategy for Jellyfish. Tom has over 20 years experience as a strategist in the world's best marketing communication agencies. He is an expert in effectiveness, but uses it to help brands be more creative rather than be inhibited because of it. Dr. Grace Kite is business economist and a big proponent of econometric market mix modeling to answer the fundamental question, how do we prove our marketing and advertising impacts sales? She founded a business now known as Magic Numbers in 2010. Welcome, Grace. Welcome, Tom. Our discussion today aims to centre on the importance of brand building in uncertain economic times. Now, let me start with a quote pinched from one of your articles, Tom, on brand, the most valuable business tool ever invented. What a great headline that is. It's a quote by the great Jeremy Billmore. Brands are fiendishly complicated, elusive, slippery, half real, half virtual things. And when CEOs try to think about brands, their brains hurt. With your impressive and extensive bodies of work in advertising, my first question is, I'd like you to try and help us understand why should companies invest in their brands? Surely advertising is just about ROI. A, a brand is a collection of memories and thoughts and associations in the minds of your consumer. And if those memories and associations have been built, if they're present, you are more likely to get chosen when that consumer falls into the marketplace and needs to make a brand choice. And not only that, you're more likely to be able to uh, charge a premium for your product if you have a really strong brand. So two really good reasons why having a strong brand is, is a powerful thing. I'd just add to that that um, you know the, the job can be different depending on on who you are um, and what your objectives are. So every business needs to have um, memories that that in people's minds that help help them buy your product. But there are other jobs too. If you're selling secondhand cars online, the job is to build trust. Um, and if you're the first into a new category, the job is to get that land grabbed. Absolutely. So let me unpick your perspective on on brand building, how it's evolved. Grace, I want to start with you. I want to quote from your piece, Feedback from the Frontline, in October of last year. Uh, advertising works, even unawarded advertising, returns on average £3.80 for every pound spent, with online channels deserving their place in the media mix to the tune of 40 to 50%. But actually, the larger awarded brands have three times that, like £9. You know, what role does brand advertising built in driving that effectiveness. I just want to pause a little bit because that's a great stat, isn't Fabulous it? Fabulous stat. Three pounds eighty back for one pound spent. Yeah. You know, take that to the CFO. That's the unawarded ones as and well. And that's the unawarded ones. Wow. Yeah. Um, and, and that came from econometrics, um, which is like a, a, sometimes called market mix modeling. And that's a really good way to evaluate brands um, advertising and to put it alongside other types of communication and see what's working best. Yeah. Um, and we, we at Magic Numbers brought together lots of um, econometrics evaluations and, and put them all together, hundreds and hundreds of them, to, um, to, to get that average, that killer stat. Yeah. And what's the importance of the unawarded? You know, a one unawarded stat, it, it feels a little bit disingenuous. Because you, <laughs> you've got the great awards, the great award winners, they get nine pounds. Yeah. The unawarded, three pounds 80, Tom? Well, it, it's, it's a phenomenal uh, thing uh, Grace is doing with the ARC database because previously a lot of our learning about advertising has been, has been founded on the tiny, tiny percentage of, of, of brands that get awards yeah. and are entered for awards. This is the, the, the mass, the normal, the average, and even those ones... Um, are, are delivering fantastically when they advertise. So um, I think it, the, the ARC database has this great um, potential for us to learn loads and loads of great stuff from just ordinary advertising, ordinary brands, not just the, the CAN award winners, the IPA award winners. Yeah, which is a brilliant stat then. It makes the stat even more valuable when it's, 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 it's not just the great and the good, it's, it's every brand out there has that potential to drive 3.8 3 times the return on investment. 
um, through, through branding. Fantastic. Tom, I'm particularly interested in your views since you wrote the, the wrong and the short of it, an article you wrote in 2020. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a parody on the long and the short of it by Peter Field and Les Binet. Um, uh, but you wrote that before you joined Jellyfish. And when I read it, I felt mm, this is a creative guy who, who's not particularly interested in, in, in online metrics. But now you're at one of the best digital marketing agencies on the planet. Um, how's your pers perspective evolved? Well, I, I'm not sure I wrote it entirely from that perspective. I was trying to be balanced. I was trying to be nuanced. I maybe was I trying just, to... Maybe I had my Google hat on. Too, maybe. Too, too, too maybe deep, you're feeling yeah. defensive. Yeah. I was, yeah. What I was trying to say was uh, this is actually the same thing that Les and Peter talk about, which is balance, the importance yeah. of and. Yeah. Uh, long and short together. Yeah. Um, and those two things are really, really important. Don't do one or the other. Always do both. And... and in addition, try and get the two working together properly, integrate them, try and get your, your, your short-term advertising to be as connected as possible to your long-term. And that way we can, we can maximise returns and we can stop leaving money on the table. Yeah. So it's, it's all about getting the, the symmetry of, of the branding and performance working together okay. at all times. As much as possible. Yeah. And of course, there will be, there'll be you know, some differences and you can never, you know, there are dangers in, in kind of blending things together too much because you, you want to make sure each channel is working to the best of its ability. Um, but yeah, absolutely, try, try to, trying to do the best of both. And then, then just pick up on that, you know, measuring both working, you know, almost in their, in their own right. Grace, how do you unpick that to the ensuring as you look to build your brand, you are measuring both that that brand growth and the performance growth in, in that sort of symmetry of, of, of total growth. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm going to let my biases out here and yeah. I think econometrics really is the way to go here. But you know, one thing I would say is that it, it, it is nowadays much um, easier than it used to be. It's not as extensive or as expensive um, as, it, as, it, as it has been um, in years gone by. And that's partly because of better data being available. And one thing I just one thing I would caution though is is you know um, market mix modeling can 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 go wrong if it's too automated. Right. Um, it does need people involved in it, and the reason we know that is because you know we've we've interviewed CMOs, and what they say is that the numbers on their own don't bring about change. You need people um, involved in those kind of projects and doing that kind of work. So it's not just magic numbers; it's magic touch as well. That's the right. Human, the human magic. Yeah, it's human. Fantastic, love it. Um, so. Let me get on to the, the, the billion dollar question of, of, of today, which is how do you recommend to both agencies and to CMOs, they position branding as an investment vehicle for, for the companies to CFOs and CEOs? It's really difficult because um, all of the learning, all of the research, all of the theory absolutely points in one direction. All of it is very, very consistent. It says, if you cut your advertising budget, particularly your brand building budgets, um, your, your mental availability will decline. You will let in uh, the opportunity for your competitors to get more salience and awareness, um, and you will therefore lose sales to them. Your, you, 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 you risk um, de declines in sales, declines in profitability. But then when you get into the complexities of real life, real practical, you know, conversations with with real brands you get into the nuances uh, and, and you can't really make too many generalizations you have to get into the specifics how how can you speak to a CMO who's who's having to let people go or a CEO is having to let loads of people go about continuing to 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 to, to, to spend the same amount on advertising yeah. it's very difficult yeah. and of course different categories will have different dynamics uh, there'll be categories where um, there'll be you know, you know it, it, there is just not very much demand in the category. And so obviously you're not going to be pushing lots of short-term sales activation type advertising in, in those categories. So you have to be more nuanced than just, this is what the research says, um, this is the theory. You have to get into the practicalities. Well, I guess you talk about the practicalities, perhaps then Grace, how do you um, sell in those practicalities? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm an economist, but you don't have to be an economist to know that when you want to um, think about a particular type of investment, you should weigh up its cost versus its benefits. Sure. 
right? And that is how CMOs should be speaking to the CFO and the CEO about brand investment. It costs this much, but guess what? We think it's going to return this much, so it's worth doing. And the argument that sits behind a lot of the research that um, you know, you know, Tom was just talking about there, that the IPA and others have put out, is that the benefits can still be quite high because um, it's long-lasting uh, communications effect and um, it will still be active at the time when the category and the economy recovers. So you get to win in that bounce back. So to wrap up this, that piece on branding saliency for CFOs and CEOs, what you're talking about is like the, what Byron Sharp would say, Tom, is that um, branding is about mental availability and creating memories uh, and grace if i take it from what you're saying is is very much a bit more like what jeremy bullmore always says is that great advertising sells now and forever um, and we just need to keep reminding people of that as we hit harder times um, that branding is now and forever but let me pick up with with you tom um, on your seven fundamental principles uh, of effective marketing communication that will always be true. Um, you know, this is from an article uh, in A World of Change, What Won't, that you wrote um, in 2021. I mean, I want to know, do those seven fundamentals still hold true in high energy prices, high mm -hmm. inflationary times? Okay, so what are those? Reach, attention, creativity, consistency, distinctiveness, emotion, motivation. Beautiful. The seven? That is the seven. Um, I can't. Let me just just slow that down because people may not have caught those. So <laughs> what it was? It's reach, acquiring new and light buyers. It's attention. It's creativity. It's distinctiveness. Um, it's consistency. It's emotion and it's motivation. That's pretty core cool stuff. I, I wouldn't. I can't see a situation in which any of those things would drop off the radar or be less important, even in really really tough times. I think. Uh, when you get into what do we need to do differently right now, of course you're going to be evolving your communication, trying to be as as relevant as possible to to, to your customer group right. and your your segments right now for what they really need. So I, but I think that's I don't think that's inconsistent with so, those seven. So within those with those seven in mind, how would you counsel marketers to be better at communicating the the value of brand building to their CFOs? Okay. There's lo again lots of good stuff in the IPA on the, the language of finance and trying to teach, market teach marketing people to be more connected with with their, their, their kind of finance colleagues. Um, people like Grace are doing amazing things, and people like Les Burnett on developing the kind of the the, the maths of it and helping t people tell the more kind of rational numbers side of the story. Um, I think there's often really simple stuff that marketing people can do um, to engage their, their finance colleagues on just the basic, simple human side of what brands are. Ask them why they wear that watch, why they drive that car, what was it that led to that brand decision? And then you can get under the skin of some really more, I guess, stories about the yeah. personal side of brands, and we, yeah. which we can all relate to, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then, Grace, we would always say that there's, you know, for Google and YouTube, you know, it's like one of the it's the, the biggest database of human intentions. Um, Les Burnett has suggested that share of search is a, is a proxy for brand salience and brand consideration and, and changes in share of search can change market share. What other tools are there that you would counsel the CMO to utilize during this, this uncertain climate to, to use to prove to their CFOs the value of brand investment? I mean, I think econometrics is, is the place to go and it doesn't have to be as expensive as, as, it, as, it, as it used to be in, in, in the past. But, you know, like you say, the share of brand search that Les has put forward is, is a really interesting new metric and, and actually adds to a huge number of metrics that are passing marketers' desks. And, and are there it, too many? There can be, I think. And, and I speak to um, CMOs and marketing directors who, who feel like they're drowning in a sea of data. Their, their background isn't really data. It's not their first love, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, was, there can be a lot of value in knowing what the right metric is to watch and then, and then seeing if it moves when you go on air. Um, and we actually um, help clients with that, with a bit of, bit of analytics called Metrics That Matter. And um, share of brand search does come out sometimes. 
as being really, really useful. So for example, in furniture and online furniture, it's a really good predictor of market share. Wow. But we found in financial services, it's not. So we're working on building up a set of data to kind of have a theory of when it's useful and when it's not. And it's not to say that, um, you know, it's not this most valuable, brilliant thing, because it, it really is, but it's knowing how to use that new tool. Yeah, lovely. And it's, you know, it's long been asserted that advertising branding increases the willingness and propensity to people to pay more for brands. Yeah. You know, Warren Buffett would say that, you know, you're only a decent business if you can charge higher yeah. prices. But does this hold true in an unprecedented energy cost spiral and inflationary pressures I guess then you're into sort of e e e economists' concepts of price elasticity and wh where, you know, just how how expensive does a, a pack of lure pack have to get before somebody will switch to an own brand or switch yeah. to another brand or stop buying butter altogether? Um, I think it's pretty obvious to me that lure pack have done a really good job historically of putting themselves in a position where they, they it could go a bit higher. But, you know, and, and you wouldn't in their situation want to have been a brand that hadn't been investing in its brand. Yeah. Um, and you would also, I suspect, you, you, we will see them doing something that, that begins to, to try and justify even further why it's OK to yeah. spend this much. Um, so arguably, so, you could be saying that the work they've done historically uh, absolutely. Um, on which is and absolutely it goes back, the, 10, back years. 10 years. So, so that, that's essential for them yeah. to have done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if they hadn't done that, you don't, you know, they wouldn't have a business, or they would have a much worse business right now, as the, the Warren Buffett quote, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that the digital world has historically, uh, or the digital advertising world has historically massively underestimated the, the power of brand building advertising to, to, to deliver price premium. It's been focused very much on the short term and, and getting a sale today. And, and that important aspect of brand building has been, has been not, just hasn't been focused on as much by, by, by some of the big um, platforms. Yeah. And I, th I think that that is gonna, um, you know, I think this, this economic environment that we're gonna go through is going to reveal to a lot, lots of the big players just how important price, pricing and price premium is. Let me talk about trust. Keith Weed ex Unilever would always say that a brand without trust is just a product and products can be easily replaced. Isbar are working very, Isbar, the, the Advertisers Trade Association in, in the UK, is soon to run an event with a company called in, Inkind Direct and Procter & Gamble to demonstrate that how doing the right thing as marketeers has never been more important. You know, perhaps distributing products uh, for free to charities, to food banks. I'd like to ask you both, what does a trusted brand look like today? And do you worry that greenwashing and perhaps insincerity about what might happen over the next year will diminish trust in brands and diminish the consumer's um, belief in what they're, what they're seeing? Grace, what do you think? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked that because it's something I, I kind of care about, which is that um, you know, the important thing for businesses to do today is, um, you know, to, to actually produce their product in the right way, in a way that's not damaging for the environment. And if they, their production process does have a huge amount of emissions attached to it, then they need to begin a transition to change the way that it's, the way that that, that product is produced. Um, and I think um, marketers, uh, our role in it um, should be to actually start to sell the idea of, 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 a, new of a future where, where we yeah. are all acting sustainably. Yeah. And at the moment, you know, the idea of, of, of a green future uh, feels really like you've got to give up a load of things and it's going to be horrible. <laughs> and actually, we marketers can change that. We need to, to build demand for green things. Um, and I think probably the worst thing marketing departments can do is, is to greenwash, is to say something's green when it isn't, and we as an industry need to stop it. Yeah. And Tom? Um, yeah, completely agree. Uh, tr trust has always been at the heart of what brands and brand building are about. I mean, if you think about what a brand really always was from its sort of early days, was, was a stamp, a name, a, a, a symbol of ownership or quality. Um, and what brands really are is, is, is a promise. 
And if, if, if a brand breaks its promise to do things, then it won't be trusted. And it just so happens that the, the kinds of things that brands are now beginning to promise are evolving and changing with what matters for consumers. And increasingly, what matters for consumers is, is things like sustainability and, and their kind of green footprint and their carbon emissions and that kind of stuff. So um, those things, you know, brands are beginning to make more promises. The ones that break those promises will, will, will come a cropper and the ones that, that keep them will do okay. Um, I think, but, I, but I, what I wouldn't say is um, that that stuff is yet the, the most important. I mean, the basic thing for a brand is just to be consistent. Yeah. Do what you say you're going to yeah. do. Serve that cheeseburger hot and tasty, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 but increasingly do it in a good way for, the, for society yeah. and for, for the planet as well. And do you now believe that, you know, as, as cost becomes a big issue, as, as we hear un economic uncertainty, um, should brands be looking for the one big ad that they feed off or should they be mul making multiple um, ads of different shapes, sizes and formats for the multimedia generation that we, we find ourselves in today? Well, look, consistency is important to effect effectiveness. Back to consistency. Yeah, consistency is really important. Um, and, you know, we were talking about earlier about how brands can charge a higher price. Mm. And we've got lots of case studies in our, in our past product, projects where that's actually happened, where we've been able to measure using econometrics the, the change in price elasticity um, that allows you to charge more. And that's always been after a period of a really strong creative being being deployed successfully yeah. over a long period of time. So yeah. consistency is really important. Yeah. Um, but it's possible to be consistent across many channels. Yes. It, so long as you've got one singular consistent brand idea that you then flex in different ways, in native ways for the platforms you're, you're, you're t showing up on. So I think, I think the days of being able to do one, one long form piece of video and that's it, um, are probably numbered. But I mean, some brands that's, that's probably Perfectly fine, but if you if you want to do the right thing within certain platforms, you do have to like how you know how, how you operate in Shorts and Reels or, or TikTok yeah. is going to be different to how you do a thirty second TV ad. Yeah. And so, if you are going to be present in multiple channels, you're going to have to flex. You're going to probably have to create um, creative that's really specific to a channel. Just make sure you've done some brand thinking that connects it all up. I, I worked with a client recently with a, a purposeful campaign, like a real ethical one. And they um, did a did the, did a TV campaign that was that was really emotional, um, and then put onto YouTube a whole load of backup for it to show that they weren't greenwashing and it was really ethical. And that was actually very very effective. It was one of the most effective campaigns I've evaluated for a while. So having those two things, one idea but two executions on the right platforms, that's an example of I think what you mean, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so. fabulous. And then let me finish. Um, this fan fascinating afternoon with a um, couple of quick fire, fire questions. Uh, firstly, um, what brands have raised their head above the parapet with you in this last 12 months and, and why have they stuck? Tom? The, the brand that I've noticed more and more is What Three Words, which is a, a relatively new, it's a startup, yeah. it's a scale up, um, and they're just really consistent, they're very distinctive, they know who they are, they speak in the same way wherever they show up, whether it's B2C or B2B communication consistency coming up yeah. once again. Mm. Grace? For me, it's mini micro scooters and they're just brilliant for kids. They, they empower children to go and explore the world. And um, my experience with them is mainly, you know, experiencing the product and seeing that, that, that brand purpose um, delivered. Fabulous. Um, what have you found yourself watching on video in the last 12 months, on or offline? Um, the thing that I've, um, we as a family have been watching loads of recently is F1 Drive to Survive wow. on Netflix. Um, having not been like an F1 fan, obsessively watching that. My yeah, son is of, obsessed with it. Really? Yeah. Um, and we'll watch three hours of it in an evening, which really proves that Gen Z, um, my kids, and you know, they do have attention spans. They will sit in front of things and watch it, watch longer form stuff. They're not just about short form video. And they're being hit with brand messaging during that? Uh, it's it's the most astonishing display of product placement you've ever seen. I mean, it's right. an unbelievable brand campaign for yeah. Formula One. Yeah, fabulous. Grace, what's, what have you been watching? Me and the kids love Bear Grylls. You know that one where you get to choose your own adventure and you can make him eat something horrible or climb oh, wow. a... I've not seen it. Have you not seen no. that? Oh, it's really excellent. It's interactive okay. TV on Netflix. Interactive ne TV yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. Okay, and then, then the last, last quick fire. What was the last thing you watched on YouTube, Tom? 
Um, probably, so my kids are forever showing me stuff um, from Do Perfect or Mr. Beast or some of that. So it'll be a, some kind of YouTube um, creator um, doing something um, remarkable. Something remarkable. Grace. I watch, I watch how to, how to do things on YouTube. So I'm always going to how to do this. Um, and the most recent one was, how do you get through this particular level in the Star Wars Lego game? <laughs> OK, OK. Yeah, well, uh, my, my, mine was Henley Royal Regatta. You know, it shows my age and my, perhaps my, my social inclination. But it was the finals and semi-finals, Henley Royal Regatta, exclusively and live on YouTube. Fabulous. Doesn't Fabulous. that just show the variety? available yeah, just the variety available yeah. grace thank you tom thank you it's been a great session thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a load thank you thanks